I always like to talk about my many projects. <laughs> Sometimes it seems too many. Uh, but uh, today we will be addressing especially those that I have done in Southern Navia, uh, four of them to be specific. And because there are you know, rather large uh, amounts of data that came out of those projects, the talk will be necessarily generalizing a little bit. But I guess we can address some of the specifics in the discussion if somebody is interested. Um, so uh, again, thanks the uh, the Institute for Classical Studies of the University of London and the uh, and the uh, Masinia Seminar for inviting me. And this is a very big honor for me uh, to present uh, at this well-established uh, lecture series. And especially thanks to uh, Yanis and Borja for organizing this and uh, for welcoming me here today. Now. Since I'm in the business of thinking, uh, I'm going to start uh, with usually the end of a lecture because uh, I've done projects in the, in Caristia in the southern Euboea from uh, 2005, actually. And I realize now that I look back to them, how many different people and institutions have contributed to them and how grateful I am to those people and how impossible the work there would have been. So I, uh, this is not even a small portion of those people uh in institutions that participated but i just wanted to uh, highlight and give a shout out to some of them uh, especially the norwegian institute of athens at university of bergen they have been in a long time backing institutions for me both financially and in terms of permits of course no work in greece is possible without the ministry of culture uh, and i've had the very good fortune to collaborate with some amazing people from the uh, local effort of antiquities for evia uh, and that collaboration continues very successfully I've also collaborated with the effort to paleoanthropology and speleology with my uh, friend Fanis Mavrid specifically on the cave excavation in uh, in uh, the Caristia Yetriada, and also he's one of the co-directors of our current uh, project, the Kurimadi Archaeological Project, as we lovingly called GAP. Um, uh, before the Norwegian Institute, several other institutions, international institutions in Athens have uh, uh, served as my home away from home, especially the American School of Classical Studies. Uh, which I've been a member of for 10 years. Uh, my first project in uh, in the area has been done by the Canadian Institute under the permit from the Canadian Institute in Greece. And I have had a truly amazing and seamless collaboration with uh, the good people of the Carissos Museum, uh, the guards there, especially a shout out to Litsa and Sofia if they're listening to this. Uh, finally, we have been amazingly welcomed uh, by the local community in Carissos. Uh, by everybody, uh, and especially by its leadership, the mayor, the current mayor of uh, Mr. Lefteri Serviolos, who has done a lot to help us and facilitate our research. Uh, I particularly, finally, before I continue with my talk, I promise I uh, would like to thank all of the members of my team, uh, most of them students or volunteers, specifically from Norway, US, Greece, but also from other countries. We had one season of a previous survey that we had 12 nationalities on our team. So uh, those guys have made everything not only possible, but also worthwhile and fun to do. So thanks to all these people and to many, many others uh, who have participated and in some way, small, large help to the projects that, I, uh, that I've done in the area. Uh, this is just for those who uh, are not familiar with the period that I'm going to talk about today, because I understand that you know, many people have very strong opinions about chronology in EGM prehistory, like all the other chronologies that we have. So uh, we can discuss again the minutiae of chronology. This is not a chronology heavy uh, talk, I need to warn you in advance, but just for those people who may not know uh, the period well, this is essentially what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, so fifth and uh, fourth millennium BC essentially, or BC uh, and the uh, uh, evidence for those periods that we have in Southern area. Now, my talk today is a shameless uh, theft from uh, the title of the uh, of the conference and then the proceedings uh, that we uh, did on the archaeology of Evia from prehistoric to Byzantine times a few years ago. Um, and, you know, I also, also apologize for this blatant attempt at self-promotion. But uh, when we talked about the analog between two worlds in this in the context of this conference, we meant Evia as a whole, because Evia as a whole, as some of you or most of you know, is a very large island, the second largest island in Greece that kind of straddles both the Cycladic world to the south and the mainland world. So parts of Evia are considered to be mainland, sometimes all of Evia is considered to be mainland. 
uh, parts of it are considered to be Cycladic. Archaeologically, this is visible well as well. Uh, it's a very important island in terms of Greek prehistory and history, especially history, in fact. Uh, uh, so it's definitely a liminal, so to speak, region, or has been throughout history. But in this specific context, I, uh, when I uh, talk about an island between two worlds, I especially mean on an island, what I call the island of Peristia. Uh, which is a southern part of the island of Evia. That's very different, and you'll bear with me on this, uh, to present the evidence why I think so uh, from the rest of the island. Uh, first of all, how one defines Caristia is differs on many different uh, criteria, whether you look at uh, geographical or political or historical. For example, you see here on the, on the map uh, the probable borders of the classical polis of, of Caristos. Um, and there are many ways you can define it. Uh, the thing is that it is very different and very separated from the rest of the island. It is separated in terms of geography because this uh, uh, narrow isthmus, and if you can see the uh, cursor in this here, this narrow isthmus is actually very rugged. So it's easier uh, in situations uh, where you don't have um, beasts of burden, for example, to transport uh, goods and uh, people uh, via the maritime route. Uh, but also because it's more distant from the rest of, uh, of the Greek mainland than the, uh, the rest of the island of Avia. So, for example, you see here on this rather simple uh, Google uh, Maps map that uh, this is southern Avia or the Caristia in relation to its closest land masses. So it's about 20 kilometers in this area from the mainland, as pro flies, of course. About 12 kilometers, though, from the first closest cycladic island of Andros and another 40 kilometers from the island of Kea. So uh, we cannot, we have to establish, so to speak, uh, the uh, insular credentials of the Caristia because we can, before we can consider it as an island. And I think, you know, when you look at all these uh, geomorphological features, the distance from the mainland and uh, the proximity to the uh, other cycladic islands, and then as we'll see in cultural terms, it is easy to see Southern Evia as a separate thing, sort of an island within an island uh, uh, of Evia. Uh, so when I talk about Caristia or prehistoric Caristia or Southern Evia, this is what I essentially have in mind. And I thank my friend Marcus Katsianis for this map. So uh, the boundary of the Caristia are essentially, in my view, the boundaries of the easily accessible parts of Southern Evia. So we have the main uh, section uh, highlighted here in red and then uh, additional uh, areas that can be easily accessed, relatively easily accessed on foot. Uh, we talk, we, we're talking uh, about a period that predates uh, Beasts of Burden. Uh, that can be easily accessed on foot in the other parts. Essentially, they follow uh, certain watersheds uh, in this area. And just to give another map of this, so this essentially shows uh, the areas that can be easily accessed. So what I claim is essentially that in the absence of the presence of the beasts of burden, uh, in, it was much easier to access Caristia and to move in the landscape, uh, either by using uh, sea craft, uh, when you are doing that outside of the areas that can be easily traversed on foot. So before we continue, I need to address um, we well, would definitely like to address some of the sources of the archaeological evidence uh, here, and we are fortunate enough to have a lot of them for Southern Avia, although unfortunately not a lot of this is translated into actual publications uh, available uh, to the public, although most of us working there have a really good collaboration and we access or give access to uh, each other material to those who need it. Um, so uh, we have uh, several surveys uh, and several excavations, and I will, of course, highlight or focus on those that I've done personally uh, with my colleagues. Those are the ones uh, highlighted in red. Uh, uh, but uh, essentially, uh, there's been a lot of work in the area by uh, now one, two, three, four different foreign schools. So Canadian uh, who started it all, uh, Dutch, American, and now the Norwegian Institute. So it's, it's been a pretty well-trodden area for archaeological research, especially when it comes to foreign archaeological schools. Uh, most of the excavations in the area, however, have been done by the, uh, uh, by the members of the Greek Archaeological Service, because uh, almost all of them before Gurimadi and Ayatriada have happened 
in the context of rescue excavations with all the advantages and limitations that brings uh, and all the deadlines that have to be met and so forth. So uh, we have a rather dis uh, disparate assemblage of, of data for the area, but which is still, I think, comparable. Now, if we go specifically, probably few people know that Southern Avia is one of the best or most at least surveyed, let's not give it a, a value, most surveyed parts of, uh, of, uh, of Greece. Uh, and these are just surveys that have not, that have focused on Southern Avia specifically. There have been surveys uh, in the 40s and 50s, I think interrupted by World War II by Boffman and Sackett, uh, a British team uh, that has surveyed uh, Southern Avia as part of the pan ubian survey, as well as um, a Demantio Samson survey that uh, targeted all of Avia and then also uh, found some important sites uh, in Southern Avia as well. What we have here is the, the survey specifically on the map, uh, specifically the surveys that targeted Southern Avia uh, with various degrees of intensity. So you have um, here is the first who started the old Don Keller, uh, his dissertation service done, uh, survey done in the seven, late 70s and early 80s, um, followed by uh, the Paximadi uh, Peninsula survey, also by Don Keller and, and colleagues, uh, I think in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s. Uh, to uh, the east is the so-called uh, route survey of the area called um, uh, uh, Buros Castri it doesn't have a local name. We call it Buros Castri because of the two place names on each side of the of the thing of the of the peninsula. Uh, and then um, one of the surveys that I did, the first survey that I did in the area, actually, is this one here. This is the Campos survey, which was a sampling survey because this is how much money we had to do uh, to produce some interesting results. We found 36 sites of so 16 prehistoric, and then uh, this here is the the Norwegian. Colloquially called Catsaronio Survey, but officially in a region archaeological survey in the Caristia or NASC. Uh, this is the latest project I've done, latest survey I've done in the area before the excavation in the Burimadi. Uh, they produced that survey 99 sites uh, on in a 20 square kilometer radius, so which we covered about 76%. Uh, so a very rich uh, area. And just before I'm going to go back, uh, just to give you some geographical uh, um, information. So the uh, the area of Southern Avia is characterized by two large uh, plains, which as you know, in cyclic terms is a very important uh, resource. So we have the um, the campus, uh, the Caristian campus here. This is the area where Car Carisos, modern Carisos and ancient Carisos have always been. And then we have the, uh, the Cazzaronio, uh, plateau uh, and alluvial plain uh, north of it, and they're both separated. It's a plateau, in fact. They're both se they separated from each other by this ridge here, here called the Lycorema Ridge. And then the uh, the landscape is also dominated by two large peninsulas: the Paximadi Peninsula, Paximada, locally called here, as well as the Buroskasti Peninsula uh, to the east. And you know, those of you who um, are more classically inclined, this is the Cape Cafireos or Cabo Doro. Uh, very well known uh, for uh, the destruction of the Persian fleet uh, during the Persian Wars. So to go back to um, our surveys, as I said, uh, the surveys have uh, been done by different people with different goals, with different methods. So they are difficult often to compare, uh, both in their reach and in their intensity and in the kind of targets they have uh, um, put in, in front of themselves to achieve. Uh, also, uh, this is a landscape in Southern Avia, like most landscapes in Greece, in fact, is very artifact rich. Uh, it is uh, the sites that you see here, this is just a, a amalgamation of uh, sites, all of sites from Campos uh, and uh, Katsaronia survey. Our sites in, ter in terms of, or rather we call them fine spots, concentrations, discrete concentrations of material. I think, uh, again, this differs from us one to the other survey, uh, how you define the fine spot. But in this case, uh, if, for example, in the NASC, or the, the Katsarano survey, the definition was 10 pieces of lithics within 50 by 50 uh, meters, we consider the fine spot, or 10 pieces of, of pottery. Uh, but be, uh, beyond and between those fine spots, we have a lot of uh, material. Most obsidian is found everywhere in Southern Avia, 
everywhere, uh, probably signs of uh, agricultural activities. And then we have uh, random pieces of pottery from all different regions, uh, from different periods uh, uh, found as well. Now, these are uh, Carvistian prehistoric sites. So it's a, a very rich in terms of prehistoric sites landscape. Uh, the map here shows about 80 sites, I think, that we know of, 80 fine spots again. Uh, there has been a Dutch uh, survey of the uh, Boros Kasti uh, Peninsula here that was done by a drone with some ground truthing. And from uh, our personal conversation, I know that they've also found several prehistoric sites that I don't have the location of, so I did not include them. So this number is much larger and will continue uh, to grow very likely. But again, in prehistoric terms, it's a very, very rich landscape. Now, prehistoric terms I'm using here because often it is difficult to um, pinpoint the exact period uh, uh, these sites belong to. Many of them consist of large lithic scatters or different sizes of lithic scatters, but you know, many of them large. Uh, and Southern Avia is known for, at least I know it, as one of the obsidian richest parts of, uh, of Greece. Uh, it was uh, the main uh, material, raw material used for ch uh, cheap stone tool production. In prehistory, 99% of all the stone tools we have in Southern Avia are made of obsidian. It is everywhere, literally in concentrations, in uh, different use contexts. Um, uh, it's everywhere, but it's difficult to date because uh, in terms of uh, typology, lithics, uh, two lithic tools have changed a little between the end of the Neolithic and early Bronze Age or even Middle Bronze Age. So uh, this is what our lithic specialist tells me at least. Uh, I am not one, but you know, it's easy to see when excavating, uh, for example, a site that has multiple areas like Burimadi that uh, very little changes in terms of typology. This is why we are often faced with the difficulty of how to date the sites. And, you know, survey excavations, you can, of course, use uh, scientific dating methods. Surveys, you cannot in most cases. So we have a lot of these sites that are just plainly prehistoric. Um, now, in terms of excavation, uh, as I said, there's been several, uh, most of them rescue. Uh, there have been a Phanonolithic early Bronze Age excavations in uh, Ayos Iorios in the Campos Plain. Uh, in uh, uh, Aia Pelagia, all of them rescue uh, one semi-rescue three-day project at the Placari site that was later excavated by the Dutch team looking for uh, geometric and uh, archaic material. Uh, those are, I mentioned them here and I include them in the analysis, but I will specifically focus on the two excavations that I have conducted in the area. So one of them is the Aia Triada cave excavation. Uh, done uh, in collaboration, or it was in fact uh, the project of the, of the Ministry of Culture of the um, effort for paleoanthropology and speleology, it's officially known, lovingly called the effort for caves, um, that uh, uh, my friend Fanis Mauridis and I directed from 2006 to 2010. Uh, this is a very large cave uh, in uh, the, 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 um, the slopes of Mount Ohi, the main mountain in the area. Uh, it's 3.5 kilometers long, as far as I can tell, uh, of explored depth, although most of the ecological material comes from the first 100 or so meters, and this is what we, where we focused on. We decided to excavate there because of uh, early surveyor reports that uh, this was the only place where uh, confirmed uh, late Neolithic pottery was found, the so-called Saligos type pottery white on dark uh, wares, both identified by um, uh, Demetrius Samson, as well as uh, Don Keller. So our goal there was to look for the earliest Christians. Um, we found much more than we bargained for, though. We have encountered, before we actually found the earliest layers, and we did find those as well, uh, we have encountered in, uh, in one specific area called the East Chamber, you can actually see it here on the map, We've encountered our early Bronze Age two burials. Um, the burials uh, themselves were, as you can see, jumbled up uh, pretty badly. Uh, we don't know the reason. We have a bit of a disagreement on that, uh, whether they were uh, secondary burials, whether the uh, space was used as a liminal location for defleshing, uh, whether there have been some disturbance in the Roman times. We have found some Roman lamps. Uh, 
it could have been that at Roman times or later people have gone in, looked for curiosities, gold, skulls, uh, human skulls um, that have uh, disturbed the burials. Um, we did not find any evidence of the actual interment. So we assume that whatever happened, happened on the surface of the ground. And this chamber actually has a bit of a, a slanted roof. So it reminds us of, uh, of a, a typical uh, grave type of this period, the cyst grave. So it's possible that it was used as a primary phase of burial. Could have been the secondary. Uh, Elana Prevedora, our colleague, has done an analysis of the, of the human bones. And uh, the, the article has recently come out in Greek, I think, in one of the Ministry of Culture proceedings. Now we have, it's an interesting excavation, an interesting location, because we have found evidence of minimum nine individuals, uh, ranging from uh, adolescents through people in their 50s. So deep old age, according to nearly thick and early bronze age standards. Um, they've been um, uh, mixed with animal bones, uh, especially a, a large number of uh, ovicaprid mandibles uh, for some reason. Uh, although those mandibles are often used in ritual context, ethnographically speaking. Um, uh, they have been uh, mixed with um, a lot of uh, grave objects, a lot of pottery of different types, uh, metals, uh, bone and shell. Um, I'm going to mention it in a little bit. And we have done uh, the analysis uh, of the bones, uh, thanks to again, Elena Prevedoro, we have done the analysis of stable isotopes uh, from those uh, bones. And we can tell for sure that they were local and they did not eat much fish, uh, which is uh, actually true uh, for modern Caristians as well. It is very much a meat and potato kind of country or whatever, the potato would have been the equivalent of potato back in the Neolithic times. <laughs> Um, what we did find actually is a very, uh, very well preserved um, uh, layer of organic material on which it seems that uh, the uh, deceased were placed originally. So it's a, uh, I mean, when I say well preserved, we actually have several bags of things, uh, whole things, uh, carbonized, of course. Uh, uh, that we collected uh, peas, uh, several different kinds of grains, all carbonized, probably burnt, not probably definitely burnt in situ because we were able to find the evidence of intense burning in some parts of the area. Uh, so we call it the tutti frutti layer, or at least I call it that, uh, uh, was seen to have been placed underneath the deceased. So we have clear evidence of the preparation of a burial place or place of secondary burial. Uh, First, uh, by leveling it, then uh, burning large amounts of of produce that essentially constitutes a harvest, uh, one year's harvest. There's figs, peas, you know, these are all uh, very essential um, uh, uh, products uh, for that period. That was burnt, probably, then spread out and covered by a thin layer of sand. We have also were able to, to care for excavation located in some parts. That, have, uh, that has probably allowed by reducing, creating a reductive atmosphere, removing the oxygen for this to uh, get uh, carbonized. And then uh, the burials or the dead people were placed on it. I'm still not going to call them primary burials. It seems to have mostly occurred after the area has cooled down sufficiently. We have found evidence of only one piece of uh, burnt human bone um, uh, among the, the human bones that we found. But we are missing a lot of bones. For example, we have only found two skulls of the nine individuals. So again, whether they, they were not uh, uh, removed from the primary burial place or whether they were used uh, or reused somehow, it's also possible in prehistory or you know stolen by the Roman invaders. Uh, it's anybody's guess at this point. Um, we, this is just a, a short, a small drawing of a, one of the profiles in the area. We have, of course, found below the early Bronze Age two burials. We have found no early Bronze one, uh, but after a small hiatus, we have found the final Neolithic uh, material and below it, uh, the coveted for us then uh, the late Neolithic, the Saligos type uh, pottery uh, at the very base levels. And not only that, but in other parts of the cave as well. Uh, this is not a habitable cave. Uh, by the way, uh, so the use was most likely ritual. We we uh, hypothesize at least uh, because 
the space is very small. There's a complete absence of, of light. Um, it could not have been used for more than a temporary refuge, although we cannot exclude refuge. But also we have, for example, in the far Neolithic levels, a very uh, large number of remains connected to the far Neolithic scoops, the famous scoops that would prove decoration. They were most likely not used as scoops, but had some ritual purpose. Um, the burials, uh, the early Bronze Age two burials have been um, um, they are uh, produced uh, material that's very similar to Cycladic burials. So we have uh, pectin shells, we have uh, uh, bronze or copper tweezers, we have small daggers, we have, uh, you can see here one of uh, the nicer examples, uh, carved bone tubes, um, we have uh, pixides, you see a lid, uh, this one here, uh, painted pixides. In fact, this material, if you go to the National Archaeological Museum in Athens and look at the Hollandian Cemetery, you will see the same things. However, we do not have uh, frying pans and we do not have uh, figurines, Italian figurines, which is also a, a curiosity that shows possibly a, a conscious decision not to include them in this burial context, although they are not unknown from burial context elsewhere in Evia and of course in the wider region, both in Attica and the Cyclades. Now, before I move on uh, from this site, I just want to say that uh, our colleague, uh, Rachel Vaikukal, uh, has done uh, organic residue analysis on some of the parts, especially from um, the barrel context. And she has found some interesting things, uh, which you can read about in the archaeometry uh, article. However, I just want to mention one very uh, significant thing uh, concerning the, the sauce boats, the famous uh, early Bronze Age sauce boats. According to her analysis, though two, two uh, uh, sauce boats were analyzed. Uh, one of them contained oils, probably plant oils, so possibly olive oil related. Another one contained lipids, plant-based lipids. So it could have been milk or other uh, derivatives. So. Unlike the usual uh, interpretation of these vessels as pouring uh, or ladling uh, objects for pouring or ladling uh, alcoholic beverages, it seems that they were more used for uh, oil, whether in ritual purposes, and also uh, animal, uh, like plant uh, lipids and animal lipids. So it's a very interesting uh, result that we have here that would be nice to replicate them. I'm not aware of any other studies. Uh, I'm not kept, I'm not kept in touch with the literature that intensely have to agree, but I have to say, but uh, uh, this is a hypothesis at least to, to explore further uh, about an interesting use of a very important um, early Bronze Age vessel. And now we get to our currently active uh, archaeological project, uh, the Gurimadi archaeological project on the site of the same name Gurimadi, which in uh, the local Arvanitika dialect means uh, a large stone. Uh, because there is a large stone at that outcrop. Um, this is a project uh, that I'm directing with the co-direction of Pasalis Zafiriadis and uh, Fanis Mavridis, uh, with a lot of help from a lot of other friends, uh, uh, including uh, Hussein Ozturk and um, Denitsa Nenova. Uh, it is a permit granted by the Minister of Culture to the Norwegian Institute at Athens. It's a single uh, permit, so it's not a synagasia. Uh, although we have a very good collaboration and supervision from uh, the local effort. The site itself, as you can see, the big rock, um, lies uh, at this region that separates the lower plain, uh, the campus, the Carissia campus, and the upper plain, the Anno campus, as they call it locally, or the Kitsaroni plain. We have found it during the NASC survey. Um, it was one of those several sites that um, indicated that you know, potentially this would be a good place to excavate uh, for several reasons. First of all, the location. Uh, the location is amazing. Uh, it actually controls all the approaches. You, you cannot approach the site uh, without being seen from any side. And also on a good day, uh, you can see as far down south as Naxos. Uh, definitely you can see the closest Cycladic Islands, uh, Kea, Kithnos, uh, Megalonysos, um, uh, all visible from there. Also. Uh, we have found a very peculiar, peculiar large concentration of, uh, of obsidian, which is not peculiar, but the peculiar part was the composition. And we have found on the surface more than 50 obsidian arrowheads, 
which was a very uh, large number in terms of surveys. Uh, so we started thinking uh, maybe uh, there's a specific reason why uh, we have these arrowheads on this specific site. So one of our original hypotheses was maybe this was a hunting uh, camp of some kind, which would also be an interesting uh, thing to find because we don't have much evidence for this kind of uh, encampments in, in prehistory. And then one season of resurveying, because we resurveyed the area twice to better define the, um, the boundaries of the site, we have also found a whole um, copper axe, uh, uh, a very basic type. I don't know if I have the picture here, it will come later. Um, a uh, very basic type of copper axe that um, uh, belongs to an early type uh, and also in combination with the pottery that we found on the site, uh, we assume it might belong to the final Neolithic, although now after the excavation it probably was early Bronze Age, early parts of the early Bronze Age. But, you know, uh, I don't need to tell you guys that finding whole copper axes on surfaces is very, very uh, rare. So this immediately marked the site as a potential place of excavation. Um, we approached the site uh, with several goals in mind. And you can see the, the view that you have towards Carisos in the distance uh, from the site from a drone. Um, so this would have been the first systematic excavation of a prehistoric site in Southern Evia that's not a cave, so an open air site. Um, we wanted to look for evidence of metallurgical activities. I'll come to that later. Uh, there were some indications that they are potentially uh, sources of, uh, of copper in uh, using prehistory in uh, the area itself. Uh, spoiler alert, we didn't find evidence of metallurgical activities. We have found more metal objects, but no evidence of metallurgical activities. I've actually worked on early metallurgical sites in Serbia, uh, and they are covered uh, with um, malachite, for example, you know, the, the, the ore that was brought there to be processed has left a uh, mark. We did not find any of that. We only had finished objects. We wanted to determine the use of the site, of course, especially in relation to the um, location and the large number of obsidian arrowheads. And of course, explore evidence for prehistoric maritime interactions because, again, obsidian does not come from there. Uh, wanted to see uh, what we could find in terms of uh, other evidence for connections. And also, um, we didn't see um, at the survey, although we found later that this is the first actual site of late Neolithic material in an open air site in, in the area. So I'm not going to uh, go too deep in the pottery here. Uh, we have based on pottery evidence, and we are now in the process of uh, doing C14 analysis, radiocarbon analysis, mostly due for budgetary restrictions. Uh, but based on pottery style that was uh, studied by Fanis Mavridis and recently with the help of uh, Dr. Vaya Mastriyanopoulou, uh, we have um, three distinct, actually four distinct phases in the pottery. Distinct, okay, maybe a strong word. Uh, we can discuss it later. We have uh, the beginning is the early Bronze Age II period, of which we don't have much at the top of the hill because it was likely deflated uh, by erosion to the south. And the south slope is actually where we found the most material uh, on the surface, but we have decided to excavate at the top of the hill uh, in order to find uh, better preserved uh, stratigraphic uh, layers. We have a very strong early bronze one uh, uh, layer, uh, somewhat atypical. Uh, and then we have the earlier parts of the final Neolithic, and we have uh, late Neolithic, uh, the again white on dark ware. And from two years ago, we have also found matte painted ware. That, those were not present uh, on the surface in the surface assemblage. So goes to show how how um, misleading sometimes the surface assemblages can be. Now, uh, these two are very exciting because we have now the earliest uh, site in uh, all of Southern Evia uh, that has so far only had this, these several shirts or multiple shirts uh, from a yet the other cave. So we have the earliest evidence of human habitation in Southern Evia, which is you know strange in its own right for Evia that has uh, habitation or strong evidence of prehistoric phases from the late Neolithic and Paleolithic possibly, uh, but much more in line with the South and the Cycladic world. Uh, we have also found also other sorts of evidence. So you can see this copper axe we found on the surface here. It's about 10 centimeters long. Um, we have found a needle. This is not a very fortunate photo. You can see it here, like an O rather, uh, also very well preserved in one of the top early Bronze Age, likely one layers. 
we have uh, a lot of, uh, well, we have a number of Polish stone tools, most of them small and not as many as you would expect in an area that was probably wooded. So that's also another interesting uh, fact that we should consider when trying to decide what uh, the site uh, was used for. We have found a, uh, a whole unused spondylo shell, uh, domestic objects of different kinds, several figurines, not that many, but uh, belonging to very typical types. And this is, for example, a head, we found the body afterwards of a figurine that's uh, almost identical to the one found of Telia on Nikons. We have other evidence for domestic architecture. Uh, you see here a, a remains of a domed uh, oven. Next to it, uh, also a very, very uh, burnt patch of, um, of clay, probably a hearth of some kind. We have a lot of pottery from the site uh, and a lot of lithics. Uh, and when I say a lot of lithics, I mean, we now have about 350 obsidian arrowheads from the site, which is one of the largest numbers that I am aware of in the Aegean, possibly the largest. I, for example, know that, especially when it comes to obsidian, I know of another site in Western Greece, the name escapes me now, excavated by a Danish team. They found also a large number of, uh, of arrowheads, mostly flint, but they have had a very uh, strong evidence that this was a, a hunting-based uh, uh, settlement because more than 50% of the animal bones found in the, in the context were actually from wild game. Most of our bones, uh, animal bones, are domesticated animals with an occasional hare or a deer, uh, but most of the bones come from oikaprids uh, or pigs. And we have, uh, you know, a bit of a typology of the of the arrowheads as well, because they appear throughout the layer, uh, but also most numerous in the later uh, early bronze one and two uh, periods. Now, the biggest claim to fame of this site, for me at least, is the uh, stratigraphy and the architectural remains. This is the state of the excavation at the end of 2023 season. We have a lot of walls. <laughs> I like to emphasize that all the time, but it's uh, it's amazing to me personally who have seen many of these early Bronze Age and found lithic sites that have either few walls uh, or when you find them, they usually have one or two courses. Some of these walls have 20 courses preserved. Uh, some of them cut or cut, again, strong word. They were in existence from the earliest phases to the latest phases, for example, this one. But just to, you know, I cannot overemphasize the complexity of how many uh, building and rebuilding phases we have here. So if you just look at this little section here, there's one wall, there's another wall abutting it, there's a wall that comes from here, partially destroyed, another wall underneath. There is what we consider to be uh, some kind of a later addition, probably a post hole support wall that continues here. This is so far the largest wall, it's 1.8 meters tall. Um, we have wall here, wall here, another wall. There's a wall here that kind of steps on top of it. A wall underneath, there's another wall here. A lot of walls, <laughs> as I keep saying. So this is uh, almost unique situation uh, when it comes to prehistoric Greece to have uh, architecturally, architectural remains so well preserved. Also architectural remains in this shape. We have no, essentially no straight walls. Most of our walls are curved and curved walls are not unheard of in this uh, periods or in this part of the world. Usually they're not the most dominant uh, type of uh, building. However, and I, I have, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of ashamed to admit, but we actually are not certain as of yet what are structures that we have here because we have not identified other than in the general sense that, you know, you probably would not build a wall curving towards the inside. So we assume that uh, the areas within the curve are most likely inside of a, of a structure. But we do not have a clear idea as of yet uh, what the site was uh, used for and what it looked like. Um, it's a mystery, but it's a good mystery. And we continue the excavation for the same reason and expanding to get a wider horizontal a uh, picture of uh, of the structures that we have there as well as as deep as we can go because it's also difficult to excavate when you run into walls as, as you know in Greece you cannot really destroy walls when you find them you have to keep them so you cannot remove them and you know we have these kind of small holes that we can only dig as much as we can which is about two meters before it's not safe anymore and this is just a uh, side view of the uh, this is actually the wall that's the the the, the thickest so far 1.8 meters I think this is the bedrock. We finally reached bedrock uh, uh, last season. 
uh, uh, yeah, uh, we have a little evidence before I proceed to the more general things. We have little evidence for uh, the superstructure of these walls. We have some uh, burnt clay, uh, likely used as ceiling rather than uh, a complete upper story made of uh, PZ technique or Watland dough. Uh, it seems to us that uh, most of these buildings were uh, made of stone entirely. And we have found no evidence of mud bricks, no evidence of melted uh, mud bricks on large layers of stones that I'm actually familiar with from other contexts in the Balkans. So now that I've presented in a little bit too much detail, I think for you guys, uh, uh, the evidence that uh, I based this discussion on, so what uh, this evidence can actually tell us about uh, the Phanolithic and early Bronze Age in this part of the Aegean. So first of all, if you look at the surface, um, as I said, it's difficult to uh, chronologically uh, assign sites, but we do have uh, some uh, indications. Uh, so we can extract some information for this, I think. Uh, for example, if you look at this map uh, where I marked uh, chipstone uh, only sites and sites that I consider more properly sites in the sense of they have pottery, they have lithics, they have sometimes architectural remains, or at least uh, a lot of blocks that should not be there. They were probably parts of walls. You can see that there is a preference uh, for uh, actual sites with lithics and uh, and uh, pottery to be placed in agriculture, agriculturally marginal areas. Uh, so for example, Paximari Peninsula on this ridge that separates the campus, a uh, few sites at the edges of the plains, while uh, almost purely chipstone tools, uh, chipstone tool sites are found in agricultural plains. And you can compare this with the map of agricultural land um, in the area. Excuse me. So it seems to me that there is indication that uh, the chipstone tool only sites are connected to agricultural activities. Uh, and also uh, they are, it seems like intentionally uh, the population, the communities in Karasos have left the arable land uninhabited or rather sparsely inhabited to probably maximize uh, the agricultural potential of the area for whatever reason. We can uh, talk about this later, probably maybe involved in feeding the population, definitely feeding, well, feeding the population, but also possibly for exchange purposes. So this is what we can extract from this kind of, you know, uh, general size that we can only term prehistoric. Uh, also, from survey data, uh, the Neolithic or rather final Neolithic, because we only have one uh, earlier Neolithic site now in the area, uh, the Phanolithic landscape seems to have been populated by small communities, small hamlets, uh, extended family farms, um, uh, sites like that. While there seems to be evidence for some uh, form of nucleation of settlements in the later, on the beginning of the early Bronze Age, if we count uh, Gurimadi, uh, definitely by early Bronze Age too. Uh, so we have several larger sites that we know at the moment. Uh, they're kind of strategically separated from each other. So we have, um, here is the Akirozos, we have the uh, Aia Pelagia, Aios Iorios, a massive, uh, massive site that was excavated, unfortunately, only in the in the rescue context. So uh, not much or not completely, but also very uh, strong walls uh, indicating probably even the presence of the second story. The, in my opinion, if you want to call it most beautiful and best preserved early Bronze Age um, pottery found in the area, other than the cave, of course, which is a, a burial context comes from this site. We have Gurimadi and we have another site uh, in Castri uh, area over there on the on the eastern side of, uh, of uh, Southern Avia. There's, uh, I have been um, verbally informed by uh, my Dutch colleagues that they have also found another 45 early Bronze Age sites um, in the same part of, of, uh, of Southern Avia or Caristia, but I have not seen it myself, nor do I know the coordinates, which is not, uh, which is why it's not on the map. Um, in terms of cultural identity, uh, at least when we look in the, this earliest period, you know, we have evidence these two are more or less uh, contemporary types, types of pottery, but they're all often associated with different uh, cultural areas. Uh, white and dark usually goes with the Cyclades, or you find it, of course, on, the, on all the coastal areas and the, or most of the coastal areas of the mainland. Um, while the white, the white, the uh, um, 
Not painted pottery is usually associated with uh, more mainland uh, manifestations. So having the two together uh, in Southern Navy also indicates, you know, supports this an island between two worlds uh, kind of theory that we have. That this is a liminal zone that kind of straddles both the, the cycladic world to the south and the mainland world to uh, the north and and uh, west. Because we have this early pottery, uh, we can restart thinking about Southern Navy as a potential um, place uh, or springboard from which uh, the peopling of the Cyclades happened uh, towards the end of the Neolithic. Uh, Broodbank, among others, have written uh, much about this, and John Cherry, of course. Um, so one of the possible routes through which people have entered the Cyclades and stayed, and of course, you know, we now know that there's been the visitation and some impermanent habitation in the Cyclades much sooner than this, even Paleolithic uh, on Naxos, but this was a very radically different uh, landscape and also those habitations did not stick. So with the first permanent habitation we have in the late Neolithic, and it's possible if not probable that um, Southern Avia de Caristia was one of the important staging grounds uh, for this movement, whether planned or, planned or just uh, something that happened uh, through various different, different mechanisms. Um, in terms of evidence for maritime interaction, as I said, uh, Southern Avia de uh, Caristia has a lot of obsidian. 99% of uh, raw material for chipstone tools is obsidian. Almost all of it. I'm only aware of one, I think, piece of obsidian that comes from uh, uh, Yalos, from uh, uh, from the, the Eastern Aegean. All of it comes from uh, Milos. Uh, unfortunately, we have not done any testing to see which Milos uh, source, one of the two. Uh, but clearly, this was a, a raw material used extensively daily. So that also implies a constant supply of the same material. Now, it is was a, probably a culture of choice to use that material rather than something else that's closer or available locally. And there are some local charts of not very good quality. So I assume this is why they use obsidian. One of the reasons at least because obsidian is a much higher quality material. And of course, we have metals. Um, now, metals is uh, an open question. Uh, because we find them in uh, we found them in Ayatriada, we have found uh, we have found them in Gurimadi. Um, uh, they at least uh, at Snihilo we have evidence. They probably come from the usual sources, which is uh, Lavio and Kismus. Uh, however, they are there are known copper sources in in Southern Avia, to the north uh, part of Southern Avia, close to Cape Cafireos. Uh, they have been used in the Roman times, unknown if they have been used in um, earlier prehistoric times, at the moment unknown. We have not done any sourcing on the on the uh, uh, metal artifacts. We have done uh, the component analysis and all of our early Bronze Age and Phanalithic associated metal artifacts are almost pure copper with a little bit of arsenic. So very consistent with the early early bronzes uh, before the onset of uh, of the Anatolianizing period and the true bronzes, thin, uh, thin alloy bronzes uh, that we have in later uh, periods uh, in the Bronze Age in Caesus. So why engage in maritime interactions? Uh, the usual explanation is necessity. Uh, in the situation where communities are too small for genetic reproduction, and in some cases, presence of incest taboo, the communities living in small islands would have searched for marriage partners in different communities. Now, this is not entirely true for Caristos. Uh, based on my preliminary, very general calculations, uh, also uh, on, on, on the data from uh, John Cherry and from Broodbank uh, on the minimum number of individuals based on the space needed, uh, it, I came up with the number that the Caristia, as I see it, is this one island, part of the Cyclades, uh, never had probably less than a thousand people living there, which is a pretty sizable population in terms of genetic viability. So seeking mates was not necessary outside of that community, although it was possibly desired. We cannot uh, talk about that. Uh, absence of raw materials, we clearly uh, don't have obsidian in Southern Avia, so uh, maritime interactions were the uh, source of that material, also possibly metals. Insufficient arable land uh, in terms of uh, 
when there's a, a drought and uh, a year that you don't have food, you have given some food to your neighbors. You can ask for them if their uh, situation is better, to put it simply. This is clearly not a problem in Southern Arabia uh, because uh, arable land is plentiful. And if the minimal number of individuals we had at any given time was a thousand, it was probably more. We have multiple um, uh, quantities of arable land uh, for those people to satisfy all their needs, even if all their needs were based only on eating agricultural products. Uh, this is based on, I think, uh, uh, Halstead's calculations from from um, uh, Thessaly. Now, there were probably different kinds of uh, in maritime interactions and connections. They were probably more or less important in any different context and happened with different kinds of uh, frequency and different kinds of uh, results. And, you know, I think uh, that we are uh, fairly biased towards probably the recurrent ones because recurrence are those that have place in the social calendar. Uh, they happen at the harvest, they happen in certain specific events, feasting, uh, exchange of uh, uh, highly visible um, uh, objects, uh, cons uh, conspicuous consumption. So what we see probably in terms of exchange is heavily biased towards that type. Although I think more important on day to day was the frequent interactions with the people closest to you, whether on the same island or on the opposite island. But this uh, kind of interaction would likely would not have made much impact on the ecological record. And probably, you know, we some of the imported pieces of pottery that we find could have contained something that somebody has brought as a gift, or, you know, it was probably more thought that counts kind of situation. And then we have sporadic, uh, which means that they were not planned essentially, you know, because to move, for example, from Southern Navia to Milos to get obsidian, you have to stop along the way. Uh, some form of uh, agreed upon interaction protocol must have existed to avoid conflict, to replenish the supplies, you know, uh, you give something to get something back. Uh, this is, in my opinion, a third type of interaction that we probably see in the archaeological record. And, you know, just to reaffirm this uh, kind of uh, view of, uh, of uh, Southern Navier, the Caristi as a Cycladic island, you know, from a more phenomenological uh, perspective, I mean, when you are there, uh, behind you is a wall of mountains. In front of you, looking south, is a maritime world that opens up and all the islands that you can see, usually Kea, usually Andros, Tinos. Uh, if you go higher up, as far down south as Naxos, sometimes definitely Syros. So, doing good, I think. Uh, to summarize uh, what we discussed today, I believe the Caristia uh, subnevia was actually more part of the Cyclades. I know it's not traditionally part of the Kyklos of uh, islands around the holy island of Dilos, uh, but I think, you know, culturally and in terms of in at least interactive potential, it should be considered as a Cycladic island. Uh, we have evidence of very dynamic landscapes. Uh, Things, people have moved in the landscape, people have changed the habitation, people have used, apparently have uh, had a way of, managed, of managing resources, uh, primarily agriculture resources by uh, maximizing the yield, uh, by avoiding uh, more, more uh, substantial habitation in the landscape uh, that's agriculturally viable. Uh, as I said, late Neolithic material that we have now points to a possibility of Sarnevia actually being part of the uh, movement into the Cyclades. Um, whether this is connected or not to um, um, uh, the uh, um, uh, accumulation of uh, population at some point in the early Bronze Age is a different story, but we see it definitely larger settlements become more common in, uh, in the early Bronze Age. Uh, clearly strong evidence for maritime interactions, uh, if nothing in terms of obsidian, likely metals, uh, pottery, we have imported pottery from uh, the Cyclades and from Attica. We definitely have a shared symbolic language that you can see in the material culture, especially pottery. So inclusion and uh, signaling the belonging to, uh, to these wider communities of interaction was the norm uh, instead of separating themselves in terms of stylistic uh, expression as well. Um, we have not everywhere, but we have in Gurimadi at least, and this needs further study, I have to stress out uh, a consistent or present, uh, consistently present, um, stratigraphic evidence from late Neolithic to early Bronze Age too, which is very significant because we have rarely had all of those at the same site so far, and almost never, in fact. Um, 
what is, un what is unusual for the area is that we have almost no evidence, not almost, we have no evidence absolutely in the area that I uh, term the Caristia for uh, this transitional phase at the end of the early Bronze Age too. We don't have any Castille, Lefkandi, one shape, these Anatolianizing uh, materials, we don't find them at all. We jump from uh, late Bronze Age to uh, early Bronze Age, pardon me, uh, 2A to Middle Bronze Age. We also don't have evidence for late bronze, early bronze age three periods uh, in the area as well, which is actually also more akin to the Cyclades uh, than it is to the rest of Evi or the mainland. Uh, no evidence clearly of this continuity. Uh, Final Neolithic seems to transition into early bronze age pretty uneventfully. Um, we have some evidence for social certification uh, in terms of Aia Triada burials. Now these burials are um, uh, they are not unusual in terms of what was put with them. Uh, however, they are unusual in terms of where they were located and also in the terms that those are the only burials we have found so far in all of Southern Navy. So they, for some reason, these nine individuals, uh, and I'm not going to speculate for what reason, have been buried separately from everybody else. We have found no evidence of human remains in any of the other caves we explored in the area. And we have found no other cemeteries granted, uh, you know, in an area that in a period that has produced probably a lot of dead bodies. Uh, so those cemeteries are somewhere and those people are buried somewhere, but these nine individuals from all age groups uh, have been buried in this cave. Uh, I, in my opinion, because of some special social status, I wouldn't call them elite necessarily, but there was something different about these people that merited burying them separately. Um, and evidence for conflict, I don't have to tell you how difficult that is to find in, uh, in prehistory. However, in the absence of, um, of data that would support a hunting uh, activities in Gurimadi and the presence of 300 plus uh, obsidian arrowheads uh, location that's very strategically defensive, uh, we can hypothesize at least that we could uh, potentially have evidence of conflict. Uh, on Gurimadi. Um, we have a skull at Gurimadi as well, uh, found in a refuse context, uh, but little else. And, you know, it's very difficult to prove uh, conflict in prehistory, but I think there are some indications that uh, what we have at Gurimadi was at least preparation for uh, troubled times. That's all for me. Thank you very much.